Hi, Jacob. Hi, Yi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. So it's my turn today. Awesome. Great to great to meet you. Hi, Casey. Um, I'm making both of you guys co-hosts um, as quickly as I can and spotting spotting the other. Um, people who I need to promote from attendees to panelists and making everybody a co-host, which, which uh, will facilitate the screen sharing. Just, just so everybody knows, we are already um, visible and audible to attendees. So um, best behavior and, and so forth. <laughs> Yeah, just like last time, um, I can give a two minutes introduction and just an activity. Cool, yeah, that'd be perfect. Um, I think last time I said sort of a few words at the very beginning and then, then turned it over to Max um, and then then sort of jumped back over to us and got going. Does that sound good to you, Yi? Oh. Perfect. All right, and also last time we, um, we waited about five minutes at the very beginning to uh, to to let people trickle in, which which seemed to be a, a good thing to do. Can you hear me all right? I do. I hear you very well. Great. Still just waiting for for Josh, who. Um, who's supposed to go first. So hopefully, uh, let's see. Well, he, he's got time, we've got. Um, 15 minutes yet, so. Um, Zach, do you prefer Zachary or Zach? It uh, doesn't matter. I go by Zach. I use Zachary on papers and presentations, but yeah, I'm, I go by Zach. Cool. Um, hi, Joaquin. Good to good to meet you in in. Uh, uh, How are you? <laughs> Thanks so much for for being here. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I just ask quickly? Do I have your permission to record? your talk yeah yeah no problem awesome um all right i'm gonna hop up from my computer for one second try to look a little bit more presentable and i'll be right back
All right, guys, I'm back, but with a hat on. Um, Casey, can I just check that like you're actually there and hear me and so forth? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, hear you great. Thanks. Awesome. Perfect. Um, and let's see. So Josh is uh, hopefully going to go first, but if that doesn't happen, Zach, are you fine with me um, bumping you up? No problem. Cool. We've got um, excess. Uh, well, excess isn't the right word, but we have more speakers today than than uh, we did last time. So I think um, in a worst case scenario, even we can miss one and be fine. Um, for, for the guests who are trickling in, I'll just mention, um, I'm hi, I'm Jacob, uh, coming at you from my bedroom in Ithaca, New York. And we're gonna wait a couple more minutes, I think, as, as people still join in. Uh, this time as seems seems to be going similar to excuse me similarly to last time in that um there's there's a a steady trickle of people joining so in maybe two or three more minutes i'll kick things off All right, well, let's, um, let's get going, I guess. Um, hi, once again, to everybody. Um, welcome to Stand Connect 2021, part ecology part two. Um, I'm Jacob. I think we have a really awesome program for you guys today. Um, a couple of, of uh, announcements and so forth. Um, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting like emails related to this right now. Okay, a um, couple of announcements. First, um, sorry, let me let me recenter myself a little bit here. <laughs> I'm having a crazy morning. Um, right, so first of all, there are going to be some some minor changes to the schedule. Um, what I realized we did, we did the first part of this meeting last week. And what I realized then was that the best way to get everyone talking to each other is to go to breakout rooms. And we can't go to breakout rooms in a webinar format in Zoom. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna do the breakout rooms at the very end of this meeting. And to get from the meeting to the breakout rooms, I'm gonna dump a link to my personal Zoom into the chat. Um, and we'll get everyone in breakout rooms there. That means that we'll do that at the end after the panel discussion. I think on the official schedule right now, we have it before the panel discussion. Um, so that'll, that'll be a change, but it worked pretty well last time. 
because it's a personal Zoom room, uh, we're going to be capped at 40 minutes. So just be aware of that. Um, when when it comes at some point, we'll get cut off by Zoom from the from the breakout rooms, but seems to work OK. Um, and the other minor change, we'll see, we'll see if it holds up or not. But our first speaker has not made it in yet. Um, if that continues to be the case, we will uh, move on to our second speaker and, and continue on. Um, I want to thank Yi, who's here with us from the Stan Governing Board or Stan Governing Body. I always forget what the B is. Um, and and uh, he'll, he'll say a few words about Stan and the project and, and this series in general. Um, before I turn it over to him, I'd like to mention something that I mentioned last time, which is to acknowledge that um, at least along some dimensions, the, the diversity of speakers and panelists in this two-part series has been more limited than what I would aspire to. And, and so I'd like to sort of offer an apology for that. Um, and hopefully we'll get another chance to rectify that next year. Um, and with that, I'll turn things over to Yi, and and uh, we'll get to it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yi Zhang. Uh, on behalf of uh, Stand Governing Board, I would like to thank you for uh, coming to this uh, another Stand Connect event. This is a mini symposium series of various uh, series of uh, various topics of uh, Stand and uh, Facebook analysis. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank our speakers and our host, Jacob, for organizing not one but two ecology sessions. Uh, even though Stand Connect is a free event, uh, I'm hosting um, Stan's donation link on the chat. As you may know, Stan relies on grants and the donations to support the development in our community. Your donation will make this effort sustainable. I'm also posting a link to the call for proposals of uh, Stand Connect as uh, this is a recurring event and we accept the proposals on the rolling basis into uh, 2020. Uh, if you have any questions, please shoot us an email. Uh, now, thank you and uh, enjoy the talks. Back to you, Jacob. Jacob, you're muted. Thank you, Zach. Um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule still. We're not really supposed to start for another, what, five, six minutes. Um, and because our first speaker is, uh, is not yet with us, just in case he's sprinting in, I think we might as well go ahead and give him um, right up until 1215 Eastern time. And, and uh, um, so carry on, I'll see you in five minutes. <laughs> um, cool. All right, and I'm remembering now um, some other things that I ought to tell you guys. Um, since since not everyone necessarily has has done these meetings on Zoom before, um, so a couple of features that you should know about. There's a chat, which perhaps you can find 
Um, and that chat will allow you to talk to each other or us or, or whoever over the course of these talks. But separately, there's a question and answer tab. So for me anyway, it appears kind of at the bottom of my Zoom window. Um, if you have questions for the panelists or speakers during their talks, feel free to dump them. It's easiest if you dump them in the question and answer because that gives us the tools to track which questions haven't been answered, which questions have been answered, so forth and so on. Um, and feel free to put questions there even after the talks. Um, uh, even after the, the talks um, end, because we can come back to them during the panel discussion. Um, I see that somebody just asked in the chat whether this is the right place to hear the, the talks. Um, and yes, this is the right place to hear the Stan Connect 2021 Ecology Part Two talks. Um, the last thing that I'll, that I'll mention quickly um, is that originally we had some structure to this pair of meetings. Um, with, with the first meeting being a little bit more focused on like wildlife survey analyses and the second meeting a little bit less, that's more or less broken down at this point. But what, what we do have as sort of an overarching theme across both weeks and particularly in this week is just a ton of cool things that people are doing with Stan that would be really hard to do with, um, with other software for modeling in ecology. So I, I think uh, we're really gonna show people how, how to flex Stan's ecological muscles today. Um, and, and I'd love to sort of have some more discussion um, towards the end of today about, yeah, just about that, about where we go with, with this tool and, and what we can do now and what we should be doing next. Um, as, as ecologists with sort of the best general purpose statistical software in the business right at our disposal. Um, and with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn things over to Zach, um, who will be giving somewhat unexpectedly the first talk of the day. Um, have at it, Zach. Welcome, welcome, and, and uh, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Jacob. Um, first thing, it says you have disabled screen sharing. So could you please enable that? Well, that is both unexpected and a problem. So let me enable that once I figure out how. <laughs> um, are you a co-host right now or have I failed to promote you to co-host? I believe that I am a panelist. Yes, I am um, a panelist. Think, oh, but I'm not a... Host. Yeah, you are a co-host now. Try again. I, I I thought I got everybody, but maybe I didn't. There we go. Yep. I'm gonna come yep. back through and make sure I've made everybody a co-host. Okay. Can you all now see a PowerPoint slide? Yes. Looks great. Okay. Let me pull up. Okay. No, oh, all right, it's weird. One moment, sorry. Switching, switching screens for something. Okay, well, it's not gonna show me my notes. Can, can you still see a PowerPoint slide and a laser pointer? Yes, we can, looks okay. looking good still. All right, well, we're winging it without the notes. So here we go, folks. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk here. Uh, my name is Zachary Randell. I recently just finished my PhD uh, about a month ago at Oregon State University, and I'm excited to share this work with you. Um, this is a very simple example. There's nothing groundbreaking in terms of the use of STAND, but hopefully it's a nice little contained example of how um, the power of stand can be leveraged to to ask the the ecological question here all right so today we're going to talk about urchin consumption of kelp controlled by the density of drift algae so i'm going to be analyzing some experimental data from an underwater so a subtitle experiment 
uh, to demonstrate how drift algae controls the behavior of urchins, which in turn that behavioral switch controls whether or not um, we see kelp forests or urchin barren community states. So I'm going to quickly motivate the system, kelp forests, urchin barrens, and talk a bit about the behavioral switch. I'll then uh, motivate the setup, the field experiment. I'll talk about the STAN model, the ODE system used to fit to the data, and then I'll present experimental results as well as results from model fitting and simulation. All right, so kelp forests are these incredibly diverse ecosystems they have um, an immense number of species of conservation, concern, as well as um, recreational and com commercial harvest. Uh, you may be familiar with sea urchins. They're, they're an herbivore. They graze upon kelp. So I'm symbolically representing giant kelp here. Um, and they also graze upon something called drift, drift algae or detached pieces of kelp. Now, what I want to motivate is that urchin behavior is not fixed, and instead they exhibit a behavioral switch where they typically tuck away into little cracks and crevices, they hide and they consume drift algae. And so drift is just detached pieces of kelp or other aquatic plants for one reason or another gets um, separated from the seafloor. You can think of it as leaves falling from a tree, right? It's kind of this detrital pool. And when drift is abundant, it's believed the urchins consume that. And then um, when something happens or some combination of some things happen, urchins leave cracks and crevices and actively wander across the seafloor, graze live kelp, and form what's known as an urchin barren. And crucially, this active grazing uh, provides stabilizing feedback to the barren state because it inhibits the recovery of kelp. So understanding this behavioral switch is really important from an ecological perspective for understanding whether or not a system exhibits the kelp forest or the urchin barren state. Now we know when predators are present, they can control urchins, they consume urchins. And when those predators are removed, you can get the urchin barren state. But there are also instances in which predator density does not change and we still see that switch in behavior in the switch between the alternative stable states. So it seems like we're missing something here. Now you may be thinking, this is all well and good, why do I care? Well, we have recently seen an increased frequency and intensity of disturbance events often associated with climate change. So for example, recently along the Northeast Pacific coast, we had an anomalous warm water event. This is known as the blob or was known as the blob. Um, you can see kelp aerial imagery here just got absolutely decimated along the Northern California coast. Sea stars melted. We still don't really understand what happened there. Um, urchins rose to dominance forming urchin barrens and abalone starved to death without the kelp. Multiple fisheries were closed because of this. Um, and numerous restoration efforts have, have started to kind of remove the urchin barrens and attempt to restore kelp. So this is all to say it really is important to try to understand the mechanisms controlling urchin behavior. So the piece of that that I investigated with an experiment is whether drift algae indeed controls urchin behavior. And by urchin behavior, I mean the consumption of drift versus kelp. So specifically, I asked, do urchins prefer drift? Does the density of drift control the consumption of kelp? And do urchins exhibit a switch between the two resources? And so I asked this, um, I tested this with a subtitle caging experiment. This is underwater in Monterey, California. So you have these cages with fiberglass window screening, which prevented particulate exchange. So we're able to hold resource density constant within these cages. So we had both drift and kelp in these cages. And this was a typical one consumer, urchins, two resource, kelp and drift, functional response experiment. Okay, so our drift were blades of, of giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera, that were just clipped. So we just cut the blades and the kelp were intact juvenile Macrocystis, so giant kelp. And what I wanna emphasize here is there wasn't really any difference between the two resources in terms of their composition or nutrient profile. It's the same species. What differed was their context within the cages. So the drift kind of sifted about on the bottom of the cage, kind of fell into this little plus sign crack, crack and crevice, whereas the kelp was affixed 
atop the paving stones. So this whole experiment was geared to try to capture that behavioral switch between urchins hiding in the cracks and crevices, consuming drift, or grazing the live kelp by wandering atop the paving stones. Okay, treatment tr structure across space. So each square is a cage, and you can see we had varying densities of drift, and all these cages had a single kelp plant. I'll sometimes use plant for a single kelp individual. And then we had another set of cages with the same density of drift, but with four plants. And so the whole point of this is try to tease apart the density dependence between drift and kelp upon rates of consumption of those two resources. All right, temporal sample structure. So we had this three period temporal sequence of this experiment. So we start, we put the resources into the cage, we measure how much biomass is going in, urchins do their thing, urchins graze. We come back 48 hours later, pull all the resources out that are left, measure biomass consumed, and then crucially, we restock the resources back up to their original treatment densities and put them back in. Urchins do their thing again, and we repeat that entire process, pull the resources out, measure biomass loss, and then restock back up to the original treatment level, let it run again, and then once more come back, measure biomass loss, and not restock this time, we close out the experiment. So we essentially have three initial conditions where we set the treatment levels, and then three observations of biomass loss. And this is with the same set of urchins across this three period sequence. So we have this, this temporal sequence of consumption. Uh, we repeated this experiment four times. And so we can group these temporal periods as independent replicates. Um, we also shuffled treatments across the cage array, um, across these four treatments to counter any sort of cage effects. Okay, diving into the model used. So we fit the system of differential equations to the observations of drift and kelp consumed. So we had drift remaining through time, kelp remaining through time, and gut fullness through time. So as you can see here, drift and kelp consumed or lost is simply deposited in the urchin gut. Um, I want to note that we did not measure gut fullness per se. This is simply a means to model the manner in which consumption uh, scales future consumption. So as resources fill the stomach, as F increases and approaches eta, this expression decreases future consumption. And gut fullness, I should also add, is cumulative across that three period sequence. So this is, this is the means to model the decline in consumption that I'll go on to show you that we saw in our data. Um, okay, we also, with this gut fullness, have this epsilon parameter. This is just a gut clearance. It subsumes um, processes of digestion and excretion, and it allows future consumption once F has approached eta. Um, I'll quickly motivate this logistic expression here. We have this parameter phi. So this allows us to, to capture any sort of preference the urchins exhibit. So when phi equals one, resources are consumed in linear proportion to their availability or density. With phi less than one, kelp is preferentially consumed. And with phi greater than one, drift is preferentially consumed. Um, I won't talk about priors too much, uh, and I'll just quickly mention that because resources of um, biomass is continuous and necessarily greater than zero. We used a gamma likelihood and to decouple the influence of the scale parameter from the location of the mean or the shape, we reparameterize the gamma um, per Bolker's ecological models and data book. Okay, quick, the quick piece of stand code I will mention and shout out to Yi for helping to modify this STAN model to explicitly incorporate the restocking events and the cumulative gut fullness. So we have our initial conditions of kelp and drift in period one. We set stomach fullness to zero, and then we have initial conditions for periods two, but now the gut fullness in period two is the ending state value of, of, of the gut at the end of period one. So the gut is kind of passed on. And then likewise for period three, the initial conditions of the gut 
for period three is the ending initial condition, or not the initial conditions, the ending state value um, for the second period. So this allows us to explicitly uh, fit the model to, to the entirety of this three period sequence. And just taking a quick peek at what the system looks like, we can simulate in R um, initial conditions of 50 and 50 for both resources. And I'm, I'm simulating a preference for drift. So you can see resources are lost, they're consumed by urchins, that we then restock the system, and then resources consumed, so on and so forth. Note that gut fullness is cumulative, um, and consumption, you can see it kind of declines slightly over time. That's the effect of increasing gut fullness upon rates of consumption. Um, one thing I want to quickly note here that differs from existing functional response literature. Um, there's been work done on excretion and digestion and how that affects consumption, but thus far those models have assumed that the animal is at steady state. And we, in contrast, explicitly use the assumption that, that, that gut fullness is not at equilibrium, and instead we use the approach towards equilibrium, towards fullness, um, to scale consumption. And the reason that works is because we collected urchins from an urchin barren, so these urchins are ravenous. Okay, and we had many different initial conditions, as I alluded to here, so 59 treatments for each of the periods, and so 177 total treatments, each with drift and kelp initial conditions and subsequent observations of drift and kelp consumed. Okay, a quick look at experimental data. So we can see drift consumed relative to drift available. This kind of recovers the classic type two functional response. And here's where you see that decline in consumption through time. This is the result that originally motivated the use of, hey, how can we mechanistically model a decline in consumption as these urchins have fed upon lots of resources across this three period sequence. Kelp consumed as a function of kelp available. Or, excuse me, as a function of drift available. So we see kelp is consumed when there's no drift, and as drift increases, kelp consumption decreases. Lastly, kelp consumption as a function of kelp availability, and we see nothing. There is no signal here or, or trend. Kelp consumption is independent of kelp availability and instead is controlled by the availability of drift. This was a really exciting result for us to recover. And just quickly, preference and switching. So the proportion of drift consumed relative to the proportion of drift available, we indeed see a strong preference for drift. We don't see any positive or negative switching, but we do see a rank switch. So a change in the proportion of resources consumed relative to total biomass available and then when we strip away the kelp and just look at the drift, we see that that rank switch occurs around 50 grams of drift. All right, jumping into results. So this model fit quite well in STAN. Um, we have a little bit of right skew with the encounter rate. There's co-variation between um, gut fullness and gut clearance, but that's actually to be expected given the structure of the model. Uh, and overall, I was blown away that this would work, not only for drift observations, but fitting to kelp as well. And so what I did to simulate the data, so I have 10,000 sampling iterations. Now I just took every 10th row, so every 10th set of parameters from the posterior, simulated that, and then took 95% um, credible intervals around those simulations. And here's what we recover for drift consumed, simulating low and high treatments, kelp consumed, and then gut fullness through time. And so comparing this to our observed data, this actually worked really well. Um, I, I was amazed. Uh, we see a decline in consumption. So that's our gut fullness, that cumulative gut fullness working. What we don't see is a uh, continued decline. So if we restocked and ran this out to period four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, the results would not change like this. So our model for gut fullness or clearance and the manner in which those affect consumption is not quite right, so to speak, um, but it does capture the broad patterns and, and the broad purpose of, of this model fitting procedure. 
Um, there's some interesting results here with gut fullness. I'm probably low on time. I don't have a counter, so you can ask me about that if you want. We think it's evidence of suboptimal foraging behavior in the model. Um, and then quickly, our simulated data as well beautifully recovers the observed results. Here I started with um, a, a high number of kelp initial conditions, which is why that's way up. But when we strip away the kelp and just look at drift biomass, we can see that the switch point for the rank switch is right on the money for, for what we observed. So overall, this, this was really exciting to, to recover all of this. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we're, we're excited about this result. It's showing the mechanism of drift, the effects of drift upon urchin behavior. There are implications for conservation with this. Drift could be used as a tool in small settings to modify the behavior of urchins. Um, that could help kelp forest restoration or urchin removal. Um, yeah, and we're getting this written up for ecology letters, hopefully, right now. And with that, quick shout out, Mark Carr at UC Santa Cruz for, for the collaboration. Um, my advisor, Mark Novak, and, and Mark Carr, we teamed up to pull off this work, and I teamed up with another grad student, Casey Sheridan. And quick shout out to the STAN Discourse community for all of your help. So I'm a scuba diver that is learning to code. I don't have a computer science background, so I really appreciate the patience and, and assistance. Um, and especially, Yi, shout out to you once more for your help um, with that restocking component in the STAN model. I didn't realize uh, that it could be coded up that way, so I really appreciate your help. Um, and, and Jacob, shout out to you. Thank you for, for organizing all of this and for giving me the opportunity to speak. So with that, I am happy to take any questions, and that's all I got. Thanks for listening. So just a reminder to attendees to feel free to dump questions, or to dump is not the right word, but to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, and uh, OK, no, this is a great question um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, asks, thanks for the great talk. What is the likelihood for deterministic ODE? Yeah, so I, I used a, a reparameterized gamma distribution. Um, and, and my likelihood were what well, got fed into that um, reparameterized gamma were the observations of drift and kelp loss. If, I don't know if that quite answers it. Uh, Zach, could you maybe just like at a at a slightly more basic level talk a little bit about what ODE models are? Um, you know, the existence of the ODE, but then of a model-based error term and, and how that all works. I think this is pretty new for ecology, or at least that's my sense. I haven't seen people fitting ODE models like this um, outside of disease stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um... I don't know if this will be a satisfying answer, but basically we, we are simulating with that ODE system the manner in which uh, the, the state of the system changes over time with, with those equations, which are basically the rates of change. And so when we estimate those parameters, we're, we're getting the parameters that uh, configure those rates of change, that system, and we're fitting that to the data. Um, in terms of the air, I don't know, Jacob, maybe maybe you can speak to that a little better than I can. Um, I didn't actually use the air in the simulations. Um, the air term was fairly substantial, be, particularly because period two and three didn't fit the simulations too well. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if that answered the question. So if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, Please do. Do I have it right, Zach, that, that in effect, um, the, the ODE output is getting tacked on to the linear predictor in, in what otherwise looks sort of like a GLM? That is, you have an ODE based um, prediction, I, and, then, and then the data are sampled with some residual error. Yes, yes, that is correct. I, I don't know if that's comparable to the GLM context or not, though. Maybe, Fair enough. Maybe, so maybe. let me let me try to get through a couple of other questions. Um, um, two related questions, uh, one from Max Joseph and one from Anonymous, um, which which ask, 
Uh, Max asks whether there were other tools or frameworks besides Stan that you considered for these models and what motivated the decision to use Stan. And then likewise, a question about what the process of developing this model looked like, you know, how, how did you come into this version of the model? Were you planning to use an ODE from the start or, or how did that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the first one, um, I did also fit some basic functional response models in the likelihood framework in R using the well-established libraries. Um, I, what I think Stan allowed us to do was also fit the observations of the kelp loss data. Um, and I'm not sure if we could have done that in the likelihood framework, specifically because we only have the two treatment levels of kelp loss, um, whereas we have the eight different treatment levels of drift loss. So trying to estimate a nonlinear function with two different treatment levels, I think uh, the, the flexibility of Stan really did help with that. Um, I did not try to implement this full ODE model in the likelihood context in R. Um, so I don't exactly know if it was possible, but the, the flexibility of Stan really did help with both the kelp and drift loss observations. Um, and then in terms of the other question, yeah, so we did not have the ODE system in mind at all in the beginning. Uh, when we were collecting the data, we very quickly saw that we had this temporal effect. We had this decline in consumption, as you saw with the experimental data. So we were initially thinking about having uh, an explicit relationship between time and, say, an, an increasing handling time, such that we could kind of, in the type 2 functional response, have that decline in consumption. But it became apparent that we didn't actually think that biologically, there was a change in the value of the, the biological parameters. The, the capacity for an urchin to consume drift algae is not changing. And rather what we think is going on is, is they're getting full and they're decreasing their, the rate of their consumption. Um, so I think the strength of the ODE framework in this context and, and specifically across those three temporal sequences is that it's a somewhat biologically reasonable mechanism, the filling of the gut that, that scales the consumption. Um, so yeah, that, that only developed after we saw the data and, and kind of had to wrap our head around how to compensate or not compensate, but how to account for that decline in consumption. All right, awesome. Um, we've, we've uh, just so, so everybody knows, we've heard from Josh that he won't be able to make it as it turns out. Um, and so, so we're fine to let the talks run a little bit long, um, which, which is good for everybody, I think. Although I'm, I'm bummed not to be able to hear from Josh. With that said, let's, let's get on to the next, uh, the next talk, which I guess will be Joaquin. Um, and, and as Joaquin gets ready, I'll just mention um, the questions that aren't answered in the Q&A will save for the panel or, or Zach, feel free to answer um, typing or, Let's see what Yi has to say as well. Um, and we can invite Yi onto the panel when that happens too, um, if, if, uh, if he has some smart things to say about this, which I'm sure he does. Joaquin, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I am ready. Um, I you wanna share a, share a screen? Okay. Maybe? Zach, do you have yeah. to stop sharing the screen maybe to let Joaquin share? I'm not sure. Okay, uh, now? Got it. Yes. Perfect. Yep. Okay. And thanks for giving me the, the opportunity to, to present my, to present my my job, my work. Uh, the talk is related with how we can link the SPD method with STEM. I am PhD uh, candidate in statistics of Universidad de Valparaiso here in Chile. Uh, the content of the presentation is a section of, of motivation of the problem. Uh, section with uh, related with the hypothesis of the of the work, materials and method results, and uh, finally finish with the conclusion. So uh, the motivation uh, we have here a, a very important venting result. You say Orchi is the one is the most important venting result in Chile uh, due to their large scale space and metal population structure. The cell Orchi subpopulation are interconnected by larval dispersion. So the recovery of the local abundance depends 
on the distant and hydrodynamic and characteristic of their spatial domain. Besides, the population is structured at metapopulation across a large space scale. So here we can see an image of how is the structure of the searching in the bottom sea. A lot of the searching individuals, individuals here. And this common structure for the searching is scale patch. And a set of patch form the site of pitching. Okay. And here you can see Chile and this site. And this, oh, sorry. Sorry, here you can see the rectangle, uh, red color the south of Chile, and this is the map, and this is our the uh, site of pitching with red color. Okay, so we have 13 uh, sites of pitch. So what is the problem? Currently, this resource is evaluated with classical stock assessment models, uh, and stock assessment models um, help us to calculate a cash quote for this resource. And one, a piece of information for that model is the uh, catch per unit effort. Okay. However, this estimate assumes hyperstability for the total population, ignoring the spatial dependence among teaching sites, which is a fundamental concept for population structure at metapopulation. But uh, what is the standard set catch per unit effort? Catch per unit effort, the CUE is a vector, is a crucial variable in teacher science, and often assumed proportional to the abundance for a particular uh, teacher resource. Thus, we need to estimate the CUE. Okay, that is the important part here. To estimate that vector, uh, we use many methodologies. Generally, it's a linear models, generally, it's additive models, or generally, it's a linear models. And recent methodologies applied for estimate that vector is delta GLMM, TMB, and IN. Uh, the hypothesis of the, this work is what happens if we incorporate the spatial dependence between site of pitching and can improve the estimation of the ECBE and the main research of the, uh, and this work is obtained that vector incorporate the spatial, incorporating the spatial and temporal observation and compare it with the classical uh, estimation. So uh, for material and method, I need to de uh, define to what is the Gaussian random field. Uh, Gaussian random field is, uh, for example, let S allocation in a particular area D and U of S is a random effect or random spatial random effects. So U of S in D is a stochastic process and D subset of R is a spatial domain where R measures the observation. So we assume that U of S has a multivariate Gaussian distribution continuous over the space indexed by us and defined by its main and covariance. This is very important continuous because we are evaluating the observation in a spatial continuous domain. In this case, we consider the vector S of S1 and S2, where S1 and S2 can be, for example, latitude and longitude. If we assume a Gaussian random field for the spatial underlying process, to model a new statistical problem, it is very expensive in computational terms. So how we can approach uh, that solution or to approach that problem, uh, we can use the, this proposal by Lindgren, Rue, and Lindstrom, where they propose uh, approximate the Gaussian random field by a Gaussian Marco random field using stochastic partial differential equation. Um, in this presentation, I will not uh, give um, uh, a detailed description of the method, obviously, but you can read the, this paper. And this another paper to lay with the method. Uh, this is very interesting uh, paper based on spatial model with our INLA, uh, understanding the stochastic partial differential equation approach to smoothing. Okay, so how can we express that in a statistical model? By a hierarchical model. How, how, and how we can uh, express that in a mathematical terms? We, we have a first stage with high parameters. A Latin Gaussian field in the second stage and the third uh, state for the observation, the, uh, we can express the likelihood. 
So here Q of eta is the precision matrix, U is the latent Gaussian field, and eta of is equal to log mu intercept plus f of x plus uh, u, where the matrix x is a set of covariates and u follow a Gaussian macro random field with zero mean and q is the matrix precision, precision matrix. Well, how to solve in an efficient way the that spatial hierarchical Bayesian model? Well, we can do that with our INLA. You have here reference to INLA in R in, in M, e, with the MCMC method, but with the stand, how? That is the question. For that, I need to introduce Tempty Model Builder, okay? TMB is a frequently software package for fitting statistical latent variable, variable models to the data. And the TMB code is essentially written in C++, and there is no need to supply the derivatives of the function to be minimized with respect to the parameters. Uh, the, these are computed automatically using automatic differentiation. In TMB, uh, the sparsity of the Asian is detected automatically. We can uh, do automatic bias correction or uh, apply one reporting a nonlinear function from the, for the random effect or random effect in this particular case. And the model can be parallelized uh, true. How works TMB? Uh, at the free stand, first instance, we need to define the log likelihood with the expression, typical uh, expression for uh, you use in stand. And then with Laplace approximation, you can uh, approximate the joint likelihood, evaluate the Laplace, Laplace approximation around the inner maximum, and then approximate the joint likelihood uh, of this expression. Okay. Obviously, uh, if you want to know more about how works TMB, and especially with the spatial modeling, you can read the very interesting paper uh, of Zimmerman and Wagefield, where the author uh, give us a, a, a brief summary of how works TMB, and also he put an example um, uh, that TMB code complete for the spatial modeling. So you can read this paper; it's very, very, very interesting. Okay, but where is stand apart because uh, TMB is a frequency software. So how we can uh, use the Bayesian complete inference in this case using the MC, MC, MC method, using TMB stand. TMB stand, uh, first we need to build the, mo the model in TMB and pass their log density and gradient calculation to Bayesian samples in stand through the and in R. You only need to add the prior distribution on the parameters, parameters in your TMB code. Okay, it's very the syntax of the TMB is very, very similar, uh, like a stand. So you need to load library TMB stand in R and fit the model uh, doing TMB stand of object. Sorry, sorry, of here is TMB object and the same syntax or very similar like a stand. We change. Uh, control, for example, max 3D, adapt delta, number of iteration, etc. Okay. Oh, estimate what, what are the, the data that uh, we have. Temporal observation from 1996 um, to 2016 uh, is a year variably declared as a factor in the model. Uh, spatial observation that are both sites of pitching, 15 sites of pitching. And another covariate is uh, depth, quarter, and market. We propose four models, a uh, log normal model that with that structure, and a spatial log normal model, a gamma model, and a spatial gamma model. Okay, because for example, for the first model, log normal, we uh, that model has not um, a spatial random effect, and the second one, yes, uh, that has a spatial random effect. The results, we compare the model with LPD and LU gross validation criterion. And the best model uh, with all the data is a spatial gamma, uh, followed by a spatial log normal, uh, log normal and gamma, a gamma, sorry. 
Uh, in this example, in this graph, sorry, you can see the posterior predictive distribution for all the models, all the models, and all the posterior predictives are very similar. This figure shows the, the CPU estimate by each model. You can see, for example, in letter E, uh, log normal, and uh, letter B, log, log normal spatial, spatial, uh, sorry, gamma model here in letter C, in the uh, gamma space. So the trends are similar, but the important part here is the last two years. For example, here in letter C, you can see the increase in the index estimate by the model and only gamma model. And with the spatial random effects is in decreasing the trends. Uh, to assess the potential effects of including site with only one year observation, we made two additional models because for uh, particular sites, uh, we had only one observation by year. So in the first uh, additional uh, comparison, we excluding the site number one and run again the model. And the best model in that comparison, again, was the spatial gamma, followed by spatial log normal, gamma, and log normal. And a uh, third comparison is excluding the site one, two, three, and A. And in this case, the best model was spatial log normal, followed by spatial gamma, log normal, and gamma. The interesting part here is how you can see the in all the, the comparison, the, the, the model with a spatial random effect has uh, had the best statistical performance. And in this figure, you can see the, the mean of the spatial random effects in the first row here uh, and the standard deviation in this part for compete in mode, the, the first model gamma, spatial gamma with all the observation. Uh, in the second row, you can see excluding, excluding the, the first site of pitching in here, the, 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 the other site, uh, site one, site two, and site three and eight, I don't remember. So the conclusion of the work is, is incorporating the spatial random effects to obtain a relative abundance index for the searching in a better statistical performance than models without spatial dependence, improving uh, our hypothesis in the first instance. Although the trends are of the estimate indices for our case, studied with and without the spatial effects were similar. How so you can see it, how you see in the previous image. And statistical diagnostic. Uh, clearly indicate the spatial model of performance, uh, the non-spatial version, and fit the data better. And this part, the, this point, sorry, is the most important part because this difference could be important as impact on the estimate status and trend of the stock, and ultimately the catch quote. So assessing the stock with both indices will be valuable. Okay, so we can include uh, the stock assessment models will be incorporate this new estimation into the stock assessment model to be the impact in the biomass or the trend of the stock uh, for this resource. Uh, this research uh, was done at Alto University in an internship uh, supervised by Professor Aki Bettari and in the group Probability Machine Learning Group. Uh, was a very incredible experience for me. And obviously, we had a valuable help of Cole Monahan from NOAA because he uh, created the link between uh, TMB and STAN across the TMB STAN. And if you want to know more about this research, you can read the, the paper published in, in Features Research, uh, Accounting for Spatial Dependence, Improved Relative Abundance Estimate in Aventic Marine Species Structure as Metapopulation. Uh, here is the reference that you can read if you want. And that is, thank you. Amazing talk, Joaquin. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that no one's put a question in the Q&A yet to ask one that is burning for me, which is, could you give a little bit of an overview of sort of what what the classes of models are that, that are available in TMB 
that would be really hard to hand code and stand like like what what sets of models are we all missing out on by not using TMB stan? Uh, if you want, you I can share with you and with the people uh, a simple example of the code uh, of TMB because it, the syntax is very similar between stand and, 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 and TMB. I have time? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. For example, let me show you. Okay. Can you see my, my R? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Here is TMB. It's a template in C++. Yeah. If you see here, for example, or uh, if you are working with the SPDA method, you need to work with a sparse matrix. But for example, data section here, you need to declare the data that you are using, uh, the sparse matrix for the SPDA method, uh, the Parameters related with the spatial interpolation, and then you need to declare the parameters similar like a stand. Um, parameters in this case uh, tau, log sigma, etc. And here you convert to frequent this model to a Bayesian models, add, adding the priors for the parameters. For example, uh, parameter for beta in this case, parameters uh, sorry, sorry uh, prior distribution for beta zero or tau and kappa, different uh, uh, type of pi prior distribution. And then you need to uh, run, declare the, the likelihood. This is the vector of mu, the vector of the random effects. And here you can do the, the posterior predictive distribution, etc. Use the Jacobian, Jacobian, sorry. And finally, you need the uh, report what is the, the 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 quantity that you are interested. So the syntax, the TMB, with uh, with compared with the stand is very very similar. You create your TMB your TMB model, and then with TMB stand you can, you can do the Bayesian inference directly. And respect your question, uh, you can do many, many type of, of, of models because in this case, this is uh, only SPD metal, but you can build another type of model, for example, penalty side, uh, spline, random effects, longitudinal, longitudinal uh, uh, model, et cetera, et cetera. Does any of the other um, speakers or panelists want to jump in with a question? I, I would, I'm, I'm really interested, so I'd be happy to just keep keep following up with another one or more. But I, I don't want to dominate here. <laughs> question from the Q and A: um, Have you looked at any important covariates for predicting the spatial distribution? Oh, that is a good question because uh, I was working with that uh, uh, model because I put, sorry, I take the, the, the GLM model that the modeler using to estimate the, the CPUE, but I not have working more with evaluate what other type of covariate can be uh, influencing in the spatial distribution of the sea urchin. But for example, um, the current ocean current in the in that space could be a good predictor. I think. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have uh, another type of, of data to evaluate that 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 question. All right. Well, I might pepper you with a question or two later on. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but um, let's, um, I guess, let's move on, turn it over to Casey. Um, you know, of all of the speakers across both of these two events, Casey's the only one that I actually knew <laughs> um, before this. So that's been really awesome for me. Um, you know, I, I would highly recommend to anyone organizing one of these things. It's been a really wonderful experience for me. Um, because I know Casey, I can also tell you right off the bat, which which is true of all of these talks, but you're in for another treat uh, with 
with this upcoming talk. So um, take it away, Casey. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Uh, let me see if I can share just a portion of my screen here. Okay, just make this. Can you see that all right? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. And if anyone doesn't know, I just learned this in Zoom, you can share just a portion of a window if you are lacking a double screen like I am. Um, okay. Yeah, big thanks, Jacob, for organizing this uh, and for inviting me. Just super excited to be here. Awesome to hear uh, what everyone has to say. My name is Casey Youngflesh. I'm a postdoc at UCLA. And we talked to you about some of the work that I'm doing uh, using STAN to model uh, large scale morphological change in North American birds. Okay, there we go. I also want to note that while I'm the one presenting this work, that this was actually a collaborative effort with all of these folks. So big thanks to them uh, for all their contributions. So morphology is both a cause and a consequence of how organisms interact with their environment. And in studying morphological variation over time and space, uh, this provides a mechanism by which to better understand the uh, sort of eco-evolutionary dynamics that shape ecological communities. So while the bulk of the literature in this area is focused on morphological differences among species, so these differences can of course be quite pronounced, uh, a sparrow is different from a stork, uh, morphology also varies within species. And this intraspecific variation is actually quite an important uh, but underappreciated element of biodiversity, uh, playing an important role for species interactions and the function of ecological systems. So there are a number of reasons why individuals might exhibit this variation in morphology, this variation in their size and shape. Uh, for instance, the abiotic, biotic conditions that organisms experience uh, that might actually shape this morphology uh, those things are going to vary over a species range. So temperature, for example, shows substantial variation over latitude, with areas near to the poles generally being colder. Now, given the importance of body size for thermal regulation, we might therefore expect animals to generally be larger at higher latitudes. So larger animals are going to have smaller surface area to volume ratios, which means that body heat will uh, Less body heat will, will be lost due to things like convection. And so this notion of a gradient in body sizes across latitudes is commonly known as Bergman's rule after Carl Bergman, who first formalized this idea quite some time ago now. Now, these proposed associations between body size and temperature over space have been used to motivate hypotheses for how species might respond to climate change. So given the rapid increase in global temperatures over the last half century, it's been suggested that endotherms may be declining in overall size. However, the extent to which a robust relationship exists between temperature and body size really over either space or time is unclear. So using data from a large scale bird banding project known as MAPS, I was interested in characterizing how and why morphology varies within North American bird species across time and space. So MAPS banding stations are distributed across the US and Canada. So each one of these dots represents a MAPS banding station. Uh, birds are caught in these mist nets and you know, little bands to identify these birds are placed on them. And this really provides us with an unparalleled data set on bird morphology. So just to give you an idea about the size of the data set here, uh, considering only adult male birds here, we had over 250,000 captures of birds on their broody grounds from over 100 species, and most of those being uh, songbirds or near songbirds. So while 250,000 captures might sound like a piddling data, sets in, uh, piddling data set in many fields, uh, in ornithology, this is decidedly big data. And really beyond its large size, this data set is also fairly non-homogeneous. So while the total uh, temporal span of this, this data set spans uh, about three decades or so, sampling efforts not constant across time. And as you can see from this map here, the locations of the banding stations are not uh, evenly, evenly distributed across space. So really we need these flexible, efficient approaches to analyze data such as these, a role that hierarchical Bayesian models can fill, facilitated, of course, by Stan. 
So now our two traits of interest here, uh, wing length and body mass, this is primarily what's measured at these banding stations. Uh, these two things are intrinsically coupled. So heavier birds would be expected to have larger wings. Uh, so any change in wing length or time or space may simply be due to any changes in body mass or vice versa. So to decouple these two metrics, I derived two morphological indices using empirical estimates in conjunction with theoretical expectations rooted in allometric scaling theory. So based on what we know about flight, uh, we don't expect wing length to scale with mass one to one. In fact, we expect these traits to follow a power law where wing length is proportional to mass to the C power. This is the general structure of the power law. So here W is wing length, M is mass, and C is the scaling coefficient. Now using our handy log rules, we can linearize this model by logging both sides of this equation. We now have log wing length is proportional to C times log mass. If you think of C as a slope, log M as a predictor, and log W as a response, we have a linear regression. And with an estimate of C, we could correct for this expected relationship between wing length and body mass. Uh, and this is something that we can do from our data, something we can estimate. So using a phylogenetic regression to model this relationship across species, so here we're using species level mean values to drive this slope. Uh, those mean values are the points on this plot. We estimated C to be nearly exactly one third, so something like four digits. So that is wing length increases proportional to the cube root of mass. And this one third represents our null expectation of how wing length changes with body mass within a species. And this is interesting, as one-third is what we might expect uh, a priori, given what we know about scaling. So wing length is a linear measure, it's one-dimensional, while mass is a three-dimensional measure, as it's considered to be proportional to volume. So in this case, our empirical estimates fit nicely with our theoretical expectation. So using this information, we can reproject these morphological data for each species, onto a new coordinate plane using a rotation matrix. So each of these points represents uh, one individual bird for a hypothetical species here. This red line is that one third slope. That's our null expectation of how these two traits are related. Uh, and we can literally rotate these in space using that, that, that rotation matrix. So here we have our input data on the right here. That's our log wing length and log mass here. Our rotation matrix in the middle. Um, where that theta is derived from that one third slope. So the negative arctangent of that one third is the, uh, that one third is the angle in radians. So it's how much to rotate the data. Uh, and our reprojected data here on the left, that's the, the product there. So again, rotating those, so that red line is parallel to the x-axis. And so now we have the, these new axes. We, we need to interpret these in a different way since we've reprojected these things. Now the x-axis can be thought of as this sort of size index indicating uh, a representation of the overall size of a given bird. The y-axis can be thought of as a wing index, and that is a deviation from this isometric relationship between wing length and mass. Uh, you might think of this as the winginess of a bird. Um, so in this way, each individual bird that's captured has values for the size index and the wing index. And these things are standardized within species. So they're centered on zero for species. Uh, and these two things are used as the response variables to model morphological change over space and time using a higher patient approach. So each of these uh, two indices were modeled independently. So we have two separate but identical models. So we have the response here was modeled with a T distribution uh, just to provide a bit more flexibility compared to a normal. Uh, and I should note that this did lead to better posterior predictive checks uh, compared to a normal. Certainly something to consider if you have enough data to estimate that degrees of freedom parameter with the T. Um, model as a function of year, so that beta is a year effect, morphological change over time, and some site intercept. And that site intercept was itself model as a function of latitude and elevation, uh, interested in the effect these two uh, factors have in uh, on morphology. And these models were, of course, fit using STAN. That's why we're all here. Uh, and one thing that I want to point out before moving on is really uh, some lessons that, that I learned in, do, in doing this work, uh, really some dramatic speed ups I got when rescaling my data and rescaling both the response and the predictive variables. 
So the initial model that I fit here took about three weeks, which was already implementing some of the tricks to speed things up, non separate parameterizations, Koleski decomposition, vectorization, all that. Uh, and after rescaling these data, in addition to a few other smaller tweaks, uh, the model ended up fitting in under 24 hours. So it's really a massive speed gain here. Um, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that scaling these data can make the geometry of the posterior just a lot friendlier for stand to sample. So uh, certainly a takeaway for me and maybe something to keep in mind. So to some results, uh, looking at variation in size over space, we find that individuals are generally larger at higher latitudes as indicated by the positive slopes of these lines. So here, each gray line is a species with the, the blue line represent that cross species estimate, that hyperparameter there. Um, so these results are in line with Bergman's rule that I mentioned earlier, what we might expect given what we know about thermal tolerances, since higher latitudes are generally colder. But then we have to ask the question, what effect does temperature actually play in this variation across space? So I'll spare you the details here, but I fit another model where that site intercept that I showed you before was modeled as a function of temperature to look at this. So what we see is that within species, uh, individuals are typically smaller in the warmer portions of their ranges. So this is indicated by most of those points, points falling below zero on the y-axis there, which represents the effect of spatial variation in temperature on body size. So that area below zero is that red shaded region. Each point is a species. More than that, though, we see that those species that experience warmer average temperatures, so at a range Y level, they show a stronger response to temperature compared to species that experience cooler temperatures, as indicated by the negative slope of that red line. So not only is temperature related to body size, the magnitude of this effect varies among species according to the thermal conditions that those species experience. And as a little bit of an aside here, one thing that you might sort of run into with this sort of macroecological analysis is the non-independence of the data when trying to fit a model like this across species. It's certainly something I had to contend with. So we can try to account for this by integrating some of these phylogenetic relationships into our model. And this is something that at first sounds like something that's really going to, to muck things up for you, maybe having to estimate a bunch of additional parameters. This can really be done in quite a straightforward manner. So we can provide a phylogenetic distance matrix, this sigma dis, to our model. So that's calculated from a phylogenetic tree, basically it says how far species are away from one another on that tree. And really we can estimate just one additional parameter, this lambda value. Uh, this is known as the Pegos lambda sort of formulation here. Um, where uh, lambda value estimate near zero would indicate low phylogenetic signal. So you can imagine if you have a zero here for this lambda, this distance matrix doesn't really contribute anything to this term up here. Um, whereas the value near zero for lambda, uh, it's really, you're saying that this variation follows a Brownian motion model of evolution. And this is something that you can easily incorporate into your models using STAN. There are also some other ways to go about this using Gaussian processes and whatnot. Uh, MapCoreath has a really nice section about this in statistical rethinking, if anyone is interested. All right, back to some results. Uh, if we then look at variation in size over time rather than space, we see that body size is generally decreasing over the last several decades. So as before, each gray line is a species here, that cross species estimate, that hyperparameter shown in blue. Um, but again, we have to ask the question, is temperature really driving these patterns through time? Uh, and we find that temp fluctuations of temperature are actually associated with changes in body size with time as well. So we can have warmer temperatures, smaller individuals. And this is true whether we consider temperature in the year of capture or one or two years prior to capture, um, which would be the potential hatch years for many of these individuals. But taking this one step further, using the flexibility of hierarchical models within species, uh, populations in warmer regions show a stronger temperature response compared to populations in cooler regions. So this is indicated here by the deep red hues in the southern US for this one species, red-eyed vireo. Uh, and that southern US portion is really the, the warmest portion of this species range, represented by those white isoclines. So this tells us that it is likely the hottest rather than the coldest temperatures that are driving these changes in body size over both time and space. And so while the ecological consequences of these changes are unknown at this point, 
We do expect these trends to continue into the future, given these projected increases in temperature that we're now seeing. If we now consider the wing index, just quickly touch on this. Uh, within species, interestingly, we find that birds actually have relatively longer wings at higher elevations. So if any of you have spent any time at altitude, you'll know that the difference in air density uh, compared to sea level can be quite notable. So fewer molecules in the air uh, that make breathing more difficult at, at altitude also are going to reduce the amount of lift that a wing can provide. So these longer wings are likely a compensatory response to this reduced air density. Now the notion that birds have longer wings at higher elevations was, doc was documented some time ago However, wing length was always taken to be an indicator of body size, which is actually not the case as, as we see. Birds actually are not larger at elevations, uh, larger at higher elevations, despite it being colder there. They just have longer wings. But this finding really illustrates that there are a number of non-mutually exclusive processes that are acting in concert to shape morphology over time and space. And we need to kind of tease these things apart. Of course, there are a number of other factors uh, not considered here that are playing an important role that we're hoping to get out with future work uh, in characterizing these avian morphoscapes, essentially how morphology varies over time and space, really taking a geostatistical approach. <clears throat> so using Gaussian processes, and Joaquin talked a little bit about this sort of thing, we can model a surface of morphological variation over space. So again, using STAN, we can do this quite efficiently now. I do want to point out that there are some amazing resources in the STAN manual for fitting Gaussian processes, and Michael Battencourt has a really nice write-up on the subject that you can find online. Um, so this is an example of variation of wing length uh, over space for a single species. You can see there's quite a lot of variation that's not captured by latitude and elevation. So hoping to use these morphoscapes to, to address a whole host of different questions regarding migratory connectivity, morphological constraints, all this other stuff. All right, well, I'd like to thank the MAPS team at the Institute for Bird Populations, operators of MAPS stations for providing these amazing data. Thanks to Lauren Helton for the bird illustrations. <clears throat> Big thanks to the STAN devs and the STAN user community, just providing tons of resources and everything that were super helpful in you know, helping me do all this work. And super huge thanks to Jacob again for organizing this. Uh, yeah, this, this has been really awesome. Uh, feel free to get in touch for any reason, and I'm happy to take any questions. We've got one question already, which I think must be on a lot of people's minds, which is curiosity from Max Joseph about um, exactly what you scaled and, and how um, in order to realize a speed up that large in, in this context. And, and I'll tack my own question related on, which is whether you have any sense of whether the speed up was mostly realized early in warm up. Um, that is, that is, were you were you stuck in in a region where it took the model huge tree depths and forever to adapt well, or or you know did did the speed up persist straight through all the whole thing? Yeah, all really good questions. So for the for the scaling stuff, you know, part of this was just scaling the the covariates. You know, when you're working with things like. Uh, you know, elevation, you're going to have values from like zero to potentially, you know, 12,000 or, you know, whatever it is, these banding stations are operating up to, or I guess it was in meters. So it's not quite that much, but you're going to have very, very small effect sizes for, for these, you know, slope parameters. So just making sure that your, your parameter estimates aren't 0 0.00001 or something, you want to scale that to sort of be somewhere around unit scale for the response variables, um, because of the way these, um, you know, we, we could have, and I did initially do this, just modeling the raw wing length values. So, you know, it might be, you know, such and such millimeters. Um, but instead, in deriving these morphological indices, all of those were zero centered with unit scale there. Um, and that wasn't really initially done for the, uh, for the computational performance. It was done to be able to interpret those things a little bit easier. So it was a little bit of a, of a byproduct there, but zero centering that and scaling that in some way, yeah, did seem to help with that efficiency. Regarding whether it was the warm up or sampling later on, you know, I think it was, I think it was both. I'm not really sure, you know, when these things first took three weeks to run, to run 
while I'm curious as to what exactly it was, I wasn't about to sort of systematically go through and, and see, um, you know, where exactly, where exactly it was speeding up. I was just happy that it, it was speeding up. Um, really, I think some of the other tweaks probably had something to do with it too, but I think the, the bulk of that really was to do with the, the rescaling of the, um, both the predictor and, and the response variable there. Um, did I touch on all the, all components of that? You happy, Max? Well, well, I, I forgot that Max isn't the panelist today. Um, so if, if he needs to chime back in, I guess he will. We have another question from Ben Swallow who asks um, whether you're detecting changes in morphology through time that might be related to varying climates um, or whether whether they're unobservable, either because they're not happening or because they're just like too slight? Um, well, we do see a decline in body size over time with warming temperatures. Um, I, I think that, you know, any change over time is going to be smaller than change over space. Well, I, it doesn't have to be, but it is in this case, just because, you know, evolutionists have had such a long time to operate on these large spatial scales where, you know, temporally it's a lot um, quicker time frame. One thing that's worth noting that I didn't have time to get into is actually, you know, we can look at the effect of a one degree temperature shift on body size over time versus one degree temperature shift on body size over space. We do actually see that the, um, you know, the magnitude of the effect of a one degree change in temperature over space is larger than the effect over time. So that tells us that there's some sort of constraint either, you know, due to evolutionary adaptation, you can, you know, actually evolve rapidly enough um, or due to some constraint on phenotypic plasticity for, for some reason. So uh, it does seem like these birds aren't actually adapting uh, quickly enough uh, based on the signal we see across space using sort of a space for time substitution sort of thing. However, looking at the rate of change over time, you know, you can uh, calculate basically like the rate of evolution, like phenotypic standard deviations scaled by the generation length. Uh, the, the amount of change that we see here, that the pace of that change is kind of on par with the, the pace you see in a lot of taxa. So, um, but yeah, it might not be rapidly enough given what we see over space. So, and I should know that there are a host of other traits too that we're interested in, you know, um, things like the size and shape of the tail, the beaks, the tarsus and all that, and hoping to get at that. So some of those questions with um, some museum specimen data and some other bird banding data sets in the future. All right, well, with the, with, uh... The knowledge that we'll have more of you in, in a few minutes, Casey, let's turn it over to Vianney Leos Barajas, who's joining us from the University of Toronto. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited for this one too. Okay, so today, um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, glad to see everyone here. Um, it's really nice to see like similar names and form this community of stat ecology. Um, I've given a similar talk uh, at the National Center for Stat Ecology and I say that because Ben Suelo is here um, and he's actually done some really cool work on uh, Bayesian inference for hidden markup models. Um, so maybe I'll actually refer to him a bit later as well. So hidden markup models for ecological time series data in STAN. Um, I'm coming a little more from the stat side. So we're just gonna talk about what you're likely to see when you apply a hidden Markov model in STAN uh, to your ecological data. So uh, hidden Markov models are, you're likely to see this graphical structure. Um, we have an observation process, which is essentially what we see, the data that we see, um, which could be animal locations, or animal movements, so it could be accelerometer data collected from animals. And there's a state process, which is referred to as this latent process. Um, oh. And for example, I'm sorry, I can't need to move this. Uh, there we go. For example, the shark position data um, is something that we will observe. And what we're trying to infer is well, when, when is the shark performing different behaviors? When is it traveling, foraging, et cetera? There's a really great paper by uh, Brett McClung talk 
uh, and co-authors on covering ecological state dynamics with hidden markup models. And they have this great structure that provides a really great overview of how hidden markup models are applied in ecology. So it's not just final moment or telemetry data, uh, it's used quite often in capture capture, presence absence, et cetera. So if you're interested in hidden markup models for ecology, uh, definitely check out that paper. So formally, uh, what I'll be talking about today is HMs in discrete time in finite state. So we would define it as a doubly stochastic process composed of an observation process and an underlying late state process, which is taken to be a Markov chain. The observations can be discrete, continuous, measured with error, multivariate, et cetera, right? So there's really no limitations on the observations that you collect. They don't have to be continuous. They don't have to be discrete. They can combine discrete and continuous data. We have ZT, which is a discrete random variable uh, that takes on values in one to N at each time T. So there's this formal mathematical definition and description on the left. And I tend to also talk about the general interpretation on the right. So the numbers of states, essentially sort of the numbers of patterns of interest. We have our state dependent distribution, which means that we have probability distributions for the different realizations from the different patterns. For example, if a shark is traveling, what types of values are we likely to see when the shark is traveling? We have our transition prob probability matrix, which describes our state switching dynamics across different patterns. And our initial state distribution, what's happening the first, uh, at the first time point. So state decoding in HMs, which is one of the things, one of the reasons I think that makes it so popular is you can connect observations to different states. There's three different types of algorithms that you can use. And I wanted to highlight the bottom two because those are actually implemented in command stat. I'll talk about that toward the end. But there's also this algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm, which computes the most probable sequence of states that generate the data. So if your states have, uh, if you're able to connect the states and use those as a proxy for some uh, ecological behavior of interest, then it's really nice to say that these observations are all connected to the shark traveling. And these are other observations are maybe all connected to the shark foraging. And you can plot that on a map and you can do a lot of cool, a lot of really cool things. And I'll show you a quick example. Um, so analyze this oceanic white tip shark data, uh, specifically overall dynamic body acceleration. You can see the histogram on the left with this multimodal histogram, which might point to potentially different uh, patterns in the data, which might have different biological reasonings. And uh, the fitted model on the right. So we have these three different distributions. So I'm trying to capture these three states. Using the Viterbi algorithm, we're able to connect the different parts of the time series to different states, here colored by gold, blue, and green. So you can see that the green is associated with higher values of Orba, which can be used as some proxy for energy expenditure. So effectively, the shark is expending more energy, more effort during these green, bar green parts. The blue, when we look at uh, the depths of which the shark swims, actually is when the shark is sort of staying, uh, remaining at the same depths. And the gold is when the shark is diving. Uh, because sharks are negatively buoyant, buoyant, they don't have to expend very much energy. And so I wanted to point out that I presented a, a poster at the 2018 ISBA inference and semi-parametric hidden markup models using Bayesian peace lines, which is actually has, is basically a poster on how to fit this model in STAN. Um, and I had forgotten about this poster, but it's actually on Dave Miller's website. So if any of you know Dave Miller, it's on his website um, and it has STAN code to fit these semi-parametric um, HMMs. And people might think, well, Bayesian inference means that it's gonna take more time to fit my model. It's more complicated. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, et cetera. I actually find it that it's actually a lot faster to fit semi-parametric HMMs in a Bayesian framework than when I have done so in a frequentist framework. For example, um, trying to choose a smoothing parameter uh, has taken me will take me a few days, uh, whereas fitting this uh, semi-parametric HMM in Stan takes me a few hours. So it's sort of unexpected, but that's really nice. So there's a few uh, ecological insights gained. We can connect the observations to different patterns. 
we have different distributions for the different patterns. We've modeled the state searching behavior, the amount of time spent in the state. In a loose sense, we might be able to try to estimate the number of patterns seen. And then we can incorporate covariates to understand the drivers of patterns. So for example, the state switching dynamics might vary over time. If one of the states is meant to represent resting behavior, you might think for some animals, they might rest more at night than they would during the day. So, okay, it's kind of like a big intro. Let's, what happens when we fit an HMM to data? And this is really what I wanna talk about today because I've struggled quite a bit. Uh, Stan does make things easier. Um, but it doesn't actually resolve all, all of our problems. So most of the time we fit these misspecified hidden Markov models, just like we do in general, right? We're always, fitting, we're always fitting misspecified models to our data, which means that no matter how good Stan is, we're still likely to see output like this. So on the left, we have a parameter mu sub one, let's say of an arbitrary model, there's more than one mean, well, more than one mean that we're trying to estimate. Um, we have 10 chains and we see that our chains are not a beautiful little cat single caterpillar. There seems to be two different caterpillars, which is not what we want to see. We can look at our log posterior and we see that it is not a beautiful histogram with one mode. We have two different um, modes in a log posterior distribution. So fitting a hidden Markov model in Stan means that you're going to see output like this which is why I want to talk about it because it can be quite scary. Let's go through an example. So we generate data from a three-state HMM. Let's say our three different states are normal distributions with different means and different variances. We have our specified transition probability matrix. On the top, we have a time series of the data. And below we have the histogram of the simulated data set. And we have the three different curves for the three different state dependent distributions. And so these are the first 500 observations, simulated data. So based in inference with HMC, um, again, we're trying to figure out what values of the parameters are consistent with the data. Uh, one of the big, let's say, uh, one of the big reasons people think you can't fit HMMs with HMC is because you have discrete parameters in your states. We can marginalize over that quite efficiently using the forward algorithm, which I won't really talk about, but let's just go ahead and say it, it can be done. It's uh, quite easy to do this. So what does it look like when we fit the correct HMM, the simulated data? One thing I tend to do, um, and in part from Michael Betancourt's uh, case study on fitting finite mixture models, I tend to impose an ordering for label switching on the means if I can, or other components. Um, let's say for now we're assuming exchangeable priors, which can obviously do, obviously do a lot better than that. So when all goes well, we're fitting a three-state HMM to data simulated from the same three-state HMM. We have this LP, which are log posterior. We have beautiful unimodal histograms for all of our parameter values. We can look at our stand output, our hat one, which is exactly what we want to see. But in reality, we don't know that it has three states. We might not even know that it's a normal distribution. So what happens when we fit the incorrect HMM, which is what we're all likely to do, we're trying to build a model for our ecological data, is that we're going to see this. We're going to look at our trace plots of the log posterior, and there's going to be, our chains are just, they might not mix. There is a jump here at the, um, the figure below. But this is just something we're going to expect to see. Right, so we're fitting, in this case, this is the results of a, fitting a two-state HMM to data generated from a three-state hidden Markov model. So we'll end up with the multimodal log posterior. And this is something that's quite known even in frequentist framework that you're going to have local maxima and global maxima, which essentially means you have different modes in your likelihood surface and there are some modes that are higher than others. And in a frequentist framework, I think people tend to sort of ignore the different modes that are occurring and they just look at the mode that's the highest. And I'm realizing in a Bayesian framework, we probably shouldn't do that, right? Because we're putting probability mass on these different modes. We just don't know how much. So 
my uh, suggestion to everyone is that when you have these different modes, one thing is don't freak out. It's okay, it happens, it happens to me all the time. But it's always good practice to look at the different parameter values associated with the different modes in our lock posterior. Because they might provide different ecological insights. Um, if we look at estimating our second mean, we're going to see that we also don't have a nice unimodal uh, marginal distribution for our parameters. And in actuality, this actually doesn't, uh, if we look at the draws from our posterior distribution, this also doesn't provide a posterior distribution for our means because the different modes aren't weighted according to the probability mass associated with each one. So I haven't really gotten there yet with the HMMs and STAN, but effectively uh, the marginal distribution for our parameters is the mixture model. But again, what I think one of the key ideas when fitting HMMs to ecological data is that we're bound to run into this issue of multimodality. We're bound to run into this issue with our chains exploring different parts of the parameter space. And first step, first thing we can do is to say, well, what ecological insights are the different modes telling us about our data? Okay. So fitting a two-state HMM to data generated from a three-state HMM without anything complex means that our trace plots are going to look kind of funky. Um, computational problems, how, do we, how well do we explore all the different modes? Effectively, maybe if we ran 1 million iterations, we'd eventually have sort of mode jumping. Um, there might be issues with uncertainty quantification. And even if we correctly specify the model, we might still end up with multimodal log posteriors. And so this is going to be quite data dependent and it's gonna depend on what you're trying to gain out of this. Specifying tighter priors might eliminate some of these, uh, these different modes if they're quite inconsistent with our ecological data or the ecological process. Right, so we're always going to run into these issues. One thing that I don't think is quite done for HMMs in ecology, which I think is uh, quite good practice in general for the STAN community, is to simulate data from the model itself. Right, so we can try to identify, to build a sort of intuition behind when we have the correct HMM and we have maybe a smaller sample size or a larger sample size, what, what will our log posterior look like under different priors, um, under different orderings? How well can we recover the true model? Um, can we actually recover all the different states? If we have a five state HMM, might need more data to recover all five distributions. So fitting HMMs in practice, I think, uh, provides some non-standard output like the trace plots, like our R hats, our hats. My R hats are typically 20. Um, and so I've gotten used to it. I've made my peace with it. And we just wanted to let everyone know that this is likely to happen if you apply HMMs. Um, especially when you're fitting HMMs to multiple time series data, it happens often. Multiple data streams, random effects, even uh, can do some quite funky things. So, as I mentioned before, there's HMs in command stand, which makes it easier to implement hidden markup models. There is a great write-up here um, by, I have the video covering the name, uh, but it's on the MC stand website. So the idea is that you want to fit an HMM without having to program the forward algorithm, so you don't have to do anything special. Um, you can get output from the forward backward algorithm, which provides you the marginal state probabilities. So you have probabilities associated at each time point with the likelihood that that observation was generated by one of the n states. And you can get output, output from the forward filtering backward sampling algorithm as well, which means that you can actually generate entire time series, posterior time series of state sequences, um, which is really cool. It's something you really can get from the Viterbi algorithm. Um, and I've highlighted the block here on the right. This is sort of the key difference, I think, between fitting an HMM in regular stand and then in command stand is that you're gonna have this transform parameters block, um, which effectively you're evaluating the different state dependent distributions for each observation. And thank you, um, that's all I wanted to present today. 
Uh, again, I'm coming more from the stat side of things, but I find it really interesting that and we're fitting HMs to ecological data. It's just bound to run into a whole bunch of different issues. And I think just want to say, you're not alone. It's okay. It happens. Um, please do check out Stan Ecology. And um, I'm an assistant professor and likely to recruit a, a PhD student next year. So I'm quite keen on recruiting a, um, women in math, stats, comp sci, especially women of color that are looking to do a PhD in stat ecology. So if you know of anyone, please have them reach out. Thank you. Questions for VNA? I also know I talk very fast, so. Well, again, while we while we wait for questions, I'll jump in because I've got a ton. <laughs> I feel funny talking so much, but one question I have is whether now with this what a forward filtering backward sampling algorithm, do you see a role for the Viterbi algorithm in Bayesian inference going forward, or is is that sort of on the frequentest dust heap? I think for Turby, I think it depends on what you're trying to use the state sequences for. So if you want just, you know, in some cases you might just, the most likely state sequence might be enough for what you're trying to do. Um, so it, it might depend. I think I've started to move away from it, but it, it feels easy because you don't have to take into account the uncertainty in all possible state sequences that could have generated your data. You just have uncertainty around the best state sequence. Um, so it's nice, it's easy, but it doesn't provide as much information as the others. And again, uh, Ben Swallow's here. Um, so he's done some cool work on Bayesian inference for hidden Markov models as well. And so I really love Stan. Um, and I love using standard for my hidden Markov models, but I'm quite curious in, in the case when you have, you know, you're going to have multiple modes, what we can do in STAN to essentially um, deal with that because it's just, it's always going to happen. And I think one of the primary reasons for not ignoring the modes is that you don't, if the parameter values for your different modes would lead you to a different ecological consensus, then that's a problem. It's not basically just not, not something we should ignore. I'm going to ask all of the speakers to go ahead and mic up, please, when you get a chance. And um, still happy to field any additional questions for, for VNA or, or for anybody. Um, ooh, open question. Let's see. Max asks, uh, Max Joseph asks, in 20 years, do you think multimodality will be less of an impediment to posterior sampling? Do you have any guess what kinds of solutions might arise? In 20 years? I don't think so, because when we, so the multimodality, I've spent a lot of time basically the past two years just sort of like trying to not ignore the multimodality and try to figure out what, why is there multimodality? Is it that my model is incorrectly specified? Is it that there's something in my data that's telling me uh, maybe the, when I fit time series, fit an HMM to multiple time series data from multiple individuals? Is it that not all individuals exhibit the same number of states? So I've tried to go deeper into what causes multimodality and what types of different likelihood structures we're likely to see. My guess is that with more data, we'll run into different challenges. Um, and in some cases, people might say, people, when I say multimodality is a problem, people will tell me, well, some, do, do those modes matter? Which is a weird thing. And so it's, in some cases, you might just have some very strange structures that you're trying 
we should assign a prior to sort of eliminate any probability mass associated with those. Um, anyway, I don't think so. I hope so, it'd be nice. A um, couple more questions from different places. So Ben asks, Ben Swallow um, asks for any advice about picking starting values, especially as they relate to multimodality. Yeah, I think that's something I'm gonna be exploring in the next few months, Ben. Um, it's effectively, if we know the conditions of identifiability in HRMs, we should probably choose our starting values to reflect that, would be my guess. Um, but also, if you wanna talk about it at some other point, be happy to. And then from the chat, we have Joaquin asking um, about whether in your semi-parametric example, the, the error term is normal. So in the semi-parametric example, um, actually there's a case study on uh, piece blinds, Bayesian piece, Bayesian piece blinds. Um, and you effectively induce the smoothing by assuming a random walk structure on your coefficients. Um, so that's where the normal comes into play. So you don't have something that overfits, you, you have a penalization. In, in the vein of Max's question about multimodality in 20 years, I'm just, I've, I've seen the claims from the, the Pi MC3 crowd that, that they can already or very soon will be able to do, you know, like hundreds to thousands of chains effectively for free um, with, with whatever their JAX GPU backend magic is. And I wonder, like, if you could do a lot of chains and stack them, would would that potentially help or or is is the issue really that that the multimodality is telling you something important to pump the brakes and not sort of interpret naively i've thought about that um whether you find them out will likely depend on your starting values so I'm guessing there'd have to be some notion of your start, starting values being uniformly distributed across the parameter space, which then you would hope that you get some types of, you know, well, I started uniformly and 70% ended up here, 30% ended up here, which means 70% of my posterior mass is here and 30% is here. And that, that would be great. And so right now I'm kind of thinking of that where we start in general. Um, but I've been thinking about that are our different modes telling us something about the ecological data? And so I work a lot with Juan Morales and he kind of just tells me when I freak out about my horrible chase plots and my R hats of 20 and 30, when everyone, you know, everything in BDH is telling me that I, that shouldn't be happening. He's like, well, look at your modes. What is it telling you about the sharks or the sheep or the snakes? And I was like, oh, good point. Hold on, let me take a step back. <laughs> and sometimes the modes have told me that the different animals are just exhibiting different behaviors. You always have like a random sheep or a random shark that decided to do something very different than the rest. And that's the, where the different modes, you're like, oh, why can't you just behave like everyone else and make my analysis easier? So I think it's, it's just important to just take a look at the modes and see what it says. And Raul Kima, I, I'm not sure if that's how you say your name, Raul, so I apologize, but asks, whom can I ask about Markov chain models with continuous hidden states, like structural time series models? Anybody? Um, Is, if anybody on the, on the thing wants to dump an answer into the chat, um, feel free. <laughs> Anyone happen to know about structural time series modeling? All right, well, I, I wanted to make a couple of quick remarks and announcements, both about how the rest of, we've got like, oh no, we got another great question. Let's, let's, uh, let's just take Eric Ward's question. Um, he writes, He's curious if you have any advice on identifying the most appropriate number of latent discrete behavior states if you don't have prior information and, and whether 
um, whether Lou or leave future out um, approaches do a decent job or, or what? Um, I'd also be quite curious to know that, Eric. Um, so I think it, I think if there's a paper, I want to say by Ben Goodrich of the STAN team that uses HMMs, and I think he uses um, Lou IC, something similar to uh, select the numbers of states. Um, I've also started. I, so I, I think that could work. Um, I'm also starting to think more along the lines of how many numbers, how many states can we recover with our data? Not necessarily what's the true number of states, because usually if you have more data, you might incorporate more information that you had before, which basically makes your numbers of states increase. Um, so yeah, I'd be quite curious to see if the YC works quite well. Uh, of course, you have to do the you can leave one time series out or you can do the block cross validation. Great. So first, a couple of announcements I wanna run through. Um, just a reminder to everyone that contrary to the schedule on the website or wherever you might've seen it, we're gonna do the panel discussion first and then switch over um, to the mingling, which will be on a different Zoom meeting. Since we can't do breakout rooms in this webinar, I will provide the link for that shortly. And we'll try to switch over at about 2.20. We'll get cut off from our breakout rooms after 40 minutes because they'll be on a personal Zoom account that, that craps out on us after 40 minutes. A um, couple of reminders. Uh, the the talks from last week, as well as these talks have been recorded. We expect them to eventually find their way onto the Stan's YouTube channel. I'll make an, um, a post on discourse for anyone who doesn't know, that's like Stan's main web user facing web page and forum for advice and help, discourse.mc-stan.org. Um, and uh, a huge thank you again to all of our speakers who will also be our panelists today. Um, and um, what else? I had one other important thing I feel like, but I forget it. So I might have to jump back in and, and uh, bother you all again. Um, but for now, where I wanted to sort of start this panel off um, over the course of the, the two sessions that we've had, um, We've heard a ton about people doing things in Stan that like I had never heard about ecologists doing until you know two or three years ago or whenever it was that I really started using Stan in, in earnest. Um, and, and what I'd love to drive at a little bit is sort of what, you know, what the questions that are out there, and we've got a bit of an audience with some students and so forth, you know, what what can we do now that we couldn't do before? What, what should we all be doing now? Um, you know, what, what direction should these tools be guiding our modeling intentions as, as ecologists? Um, and I would, I'd love to hear from any and all of the panelists um, with, with sort of their brief thoughts on, on that matter. But if, you all, 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 if you'd rather talk about something else or ask each other questions or, whatever it is you want to do. And, and you, you can consider yourself a panelist too for these purposes, um, since, since you have the privileges and the, the, um, the know-how. And I'm gonna start with Casey because he's the one I know well enough to pick on. Sure thing. Uh, for me, I think something that I'm very interested in going forward is trying to integrate all these new data streams that we now have as ecologists. You know, the traditional way of doing ecology was you go out in the field and you, you know, you take your measurements every year and you wait 30 years and then you write a paper about these long term dynamics that you've seen. Um, and it's just a different world now with, you know, satellite based sensors, you know, tracking technology, acoustic monitors, community contributed observations like eBird. So there are all these different things that we can now use together into these integrated sort of analyses that you know, are kind of tricky to do. You need to account for different, uh, you know, 
sampling differences between these uncertainty differences. And these are the sorts of things that hierarchical Bayesian frameworks are allowing us to do, but they're computationally intensive. So with all of these new developments that are being implemented with things like STAN, we can now start to do these things, um, you know, doing these multivariate analyses, things like that. I think those are the things that excite me most and what I think that's, you know, tools like STAN can really contribute to. Can I pull the panelists? How many of you guys had seen prior or you know, outside of Stan or prior to Stan, um, somebody doing something like modeling the gut fullness of a sea urchin uh, in, in order to um, figure out, you know, with, with, with sort of basic ecology plus applied applications. Is that something that was like happening before, but I was missing it? I know there's been a couple examples of the ODE framework being applied to functional response models. Um, there's a, a Rosenbaum and Rawl paper, I think, kind of a methods paper talking about doing that. And there's, and I, I tried some of their tools in R and they're fitting the ODE model in, in a likelihood framework. Um, I, I don't know if I have seen that done before with Bayesian methods or in Stan. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to get that work out there. And I, and I also said it during my talk, I'm also pretty blown away by the flexibility of Stan. Um, I, I don't think we could have incorporated the, the kelp observations into the likelihood framework with just those two points of reference for estimating a nonlinear function. So that Stan, the fact that Stan was able to do that and return reasonable estimates was was very surprising and, and exciting. So yeah, the, the flexibility is is impressive. What about hidden Markov models, VNA? What what um what was the state of of them and their use in ecology, sort of pre stan So I think again I'll kind of uh, if Ben wants to chime in. So my basic understanding is that HMMs were once upon a time fit in wind bugs and eventually moved over to jags. Um, as people discovered you know, how easily you could kind of go away from like an EM framework to maximum likelihood, but, um, basically using the Ford algorithm, the same thing that Stan does, they, it's become of this thing where it's like maximum likelihood fast, Bayesian inference slow. Except if you need random effects, you go to Bayesian inference. Um, and with Stan, you again, you marginalize all the state uh, variables out which means you're effectively fitting the same fast way of maximum likelihood with Stan. Um, so for me, that's been amazing. This is actually why I gravitated towards Stan because Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does um, basically the same exact thing that I used to do in a maximum likelihood framework. So otherwise I would probably still be doing maximum likelihood inference. Joaquin, what about um, what about you? I'm a, and I'm curious, especially um, where where uh, like where are the options? I'm struggling to formulate this question properly. What um, what what can we do now with like a tool like tmb stan um what what classes of model does it gain you, you what else can that thing do <laughs> I'm, I'm really like i'm deathly curious now about what you know <laughs> what all the flexibility that thing has that i didn't know about in stan before uh we can link 
all the model that you want to do because the flexibility of TMB is very similar like Stan. So you need to create the model in TMB and across TMB Stan, you can do the Bayesian inference. Uh, I would like to put here uh, the, the idea to do more spatial analysis in Stan because uh, in Stan, I don't know if they incorporate the sparse matrix. Do you know that or not? Because the 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 SPD method is very very useful actually because works with sparse matrix and our inla is very useful for different uh, researcher and spatial and temporal modeling. But um, I would like to extend or or promote promote uh, the idea to use TMB because. Using TMB, we can do more fast inference using with TMB stand. And in stand, you cannot see many analysis for geostatistical data. Very slow, uh, very a little uh, models because it's, it's, it's expensive for that types of models. But if you, if we can use TMB, we can do a very fast analysis for your statistical data, data. So I would like to remove the, the idea to connect TMB with, this, with TMB stand to do the Bayesian inference using MCMC method. And we have a lot of the models that we can create in, in TMB, a lot of models, splines, uh, random effects, spatial effects, ESP, SPD models, etc. So all of that, all of this model, you can create the same inference like it's done. Yi, if you're there, do you have um, any quick comments about the state of sparse matrix algebra in Stan? Uh, I think that the math kernel has been uh, almost finished. It's now the question of how to uh, link it to the language. I can hear very well. Yi, could you repeat that one time if, if you can hear us? I think um, the end might have gotten a little bit garbled. I apologize, I'm trying. Uh, I was saying that the, uh, the math components, the math kernel has been finished uh, of the, for the uh, sparse matrix. Uh, it's a question now how to make it into the language. Okay. So, uh, so, so not there yet, but on the way. Um, just, just, just yeah. for, the, for the community, I'll, I'll add. So Stan on the back end is structured as a, a math library that, that supports um, automatic differentiation over a bunch of functions. And then those functions get exposed to us, the users, through the Stan language itself and, and the piece of software that, that we call Stan. Um, and, and so it sounds like what Yi is saying is that the sparse matrix stuff is ready to go on the math side, but, but has to trickle forward um, into the, the sort of user-facing aspect of the program. We've got a, a really great comment in the chat. Um, Michael Culshaw Maurer says that it feels to him, I, I assume him, apologies if I'm wrong about that, that Stan really breaks down a lot of mostly artificial barriers between types of models. You can have mathematical modelers and statisticians speaking the same language, using the same tools, building things from the same basic building blocks. I think the challenge, especially when teaching ecologists who learn stats because they have to, is how to teach these building blocks instead of discrete classes of models. Um, and and McElreath, in, who's the author of the book Statistical Rethinking, that's my aside, um, does it better than most, but there's a lot of room for growth. Yeah, I think it, just to respond to that, I 
I really agree. And I think that a lot of, you know, I was trained as an ecologist, not as a statistician, anything like that. Um, you know, our tendency to, to teach something like GLM with, with a, with a can function, you know, students learn, oh, you know, I applied this sort of test in, in this scenario instead of actually writing out that, that likelihood. And I think the process of explicitly writing out that likelihood in a tool like Stan can really be an educational tool, uh, educational tool for um, early career researchers. And I'll jump on with what Casey just said, you know, something else that I think is really unique about Stan in, in this universe compared even to programs that do the same thing like Pi MC3 or, or um, I think there's some, some stuff in PyTorch or TensorFlow or somewhere in there. Um, but what's really, one thing that's really unique about Stan is the, the infrastructure as a community um, to pull people like me who come in as ecologists uh, sort of deep into the actual forefront I, I'm not claiming to be on the forefront of anything Stan but but um, you know at this point I've interacted with the code base and and uh, um, the the infrastructure to sort of teach us how to do new and cool things and and the community support seems to be uniquely good and and with that another plug that for for what VNA has already mentioned which is um, there is an ecology specific, community that exists both as a tag on discourse and as a website on GitHub um, that, that I'd really encourage everybody to, to check out. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, as I say this, I sort of, there's a voice in the back of my mind that, that says like, yeah, this community is uniquely good at that. Um, but, but we still do to some extent have a, uh, a, a diversity problem <laughs> as a community. Right. And, and so, um, maybe we should be thinking a little bit more about how to broaden that sort of support that, that we do as a community. Um, Raul Kima asks in, in the Q&A whether which other books other than statistical rethinking sort of go the route of teaching building blocks, um, teach the blocks route. Does anybody have, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll float one. It's, it's sort of old news at this point, but um, Mark Carey's intro to, uh, what, what's it called? It's, it's his, win, his, his introductory level wind bugs book. Um, here, I'll stop talking, but I'll dump it in the chat once I find the title. I just want to echo Jacob's statements just about the user community and Stan. And, you know, like I said in my talk, I think that's been super helpful for me. I think the documentation is just really great on the software and discourse has been really, really helpful to me, especially, you know, something like Jags. It was, you know, you, you post on a forum with your problem and Martin Plummer would try to help you out as sort of one person. There didn't really seem to be a, a community, um, so to speak. And, you know, I was never a Windows user, so I don't really know what it was like back then. But um, yeah, it's just really, it's really great to have all those resources available in the various manuals that, and, the, and the community. So it's a pretty cool thing um, that we have available to us, I think. Well, based on the experience last week, I'm going to suggest we go ahead and move on over to, um, to the um breakout room sorry for the noise upstairs neighbors doing i don't know what um to the breakout room for the uh sort of less structured discussion that that seemed to be popular and went well last time around so let's um let's do that we'll get kicked out at about 250 um but uh yeah i think that'll be that'll be fun i i just put in the chat a link to this other zoom thing that I'm about to fire up. I haven't actually opened it up yet. So let me get that meeting started over here. Start.
and feel free to trickle on over. I'm gonna leave the webinar open on this one computer um, so that, so that y'all can keep asking me questions if you have trouble finding us on the other side here. And feel free to jump out of this one and, and slide on over. I'll let you self sort. I think I'll let you self sort into breakout rooms and, and I'll see you over here in a sec. Thanks, Jacob. Um, thanks again to everybody. This has been a really great uh, experience for me um, just to organize these things and it wouldn't have worked without both the speakers and the audience. So I really appreciate all of you.